very collapsed. So this is a November 2023 revised CSRP paper. We are starting with section B. Section A being the case study, I understand you can be able to get those solutions from uh, the materials that we have. So question number two, part A, talks about the accounting principles and concepts, that is the accounting conventions, where you are told that you explain each of the following conventions. So you need to explain the meaning of those accounting principles and concepts. And as I have always advised, just make an effort of understanding the meaning of each and every accounting principle and the concept. There are like 12 of them. They normally ask a random five of them. So if you are able to explain what they mean, you get to the 10 marks. So the first one is the business entity. It is simply means that uh, the business transactions and the owner's personal transactions should not be mixed. We should not mix the business transactions and the owner's personal transactions. They should be directly separately. They should be directly separately. There is no way your personal expenses can be treated as business expenses. That is what business entity talks about. Number two, it's about realization. It's also known as the revenue realization concept. This simply states that revenues should be considered realized. Revenues should be considered realized when there is sufficient evidence that it has been earned. Revenues should be considered realized when there is sufficient evidence that it has been earned. So you should be careful when you say that as a business we have received revenue or we have earned revenue. It must be, there must be sufficient evidence that that revenue has actually been earned by the business before you record it in the business uh, reports or the business accounts. The historical cost concept, also known as the historical concept or the historical cost concept, which simply means that fixed assets, those are the long-term assets in the business, should be recorded in the books of accounts at the uh, acquisition cost, at the uh, purchase cost, and not the uh, prevailing market value. The fixed assets should be recorded in the books of accounts at the uh, purchase, also known as the acquisition cost, and not the current market price of that asset. We use the acquisition cost. We need to bought it like five years ago and it was costing 15,000. Right now, the same model is being bought at 20,000. We should not use the current value, we use the cost at which we had to acquire that asset. Then we have the materiality concept, which simply states that all those information or financial information, which can affect the decision the user of the information will make, which can affect the decision the user of the information will make, is considered material and it should be recorded in the books of accounts. All the information that can affect the decision the user of the accounting information will make should be considered to be material and it must be included in the books of accounts. Otherwise, if it does not affect the decision the accounting information user will make, that information is immaterial. If it does not affect whether you include it or you don't include it, as I'm still going to make the same decision, that information is immaterial and there is no need of capturing it in the books of accounts. But any information that can affect the decision I'm going to make, if we include that information, I will make decision A. If we don't include it, I will make the decision B. That information is material and must be included in the books of accounts. Lastly, it is about the going concern, which simply says that uh, the business is presumed that it is going to exist 
into many years in the future. It is going to exist into the foreseeable future. So the business is normally established with the intention that it is going to exist for a very, very long period of time without shutting down its operations. That is the going concern. The going concern. And because of the going concern, the business can be able to borrow even a 20-year loan because it is assumed that it is going to be in existence even in those 20 years to come and pay that loan. So the going concern, the business is normally established to exist for a long period of time. Then, having said that, we need now to proceed to question 2B, which simply talks about uh, the ratios. You are given an extract of our uh, income statement. You are given an extract of the balance sheet. The balance sheet is the same as the statement of financial position. And then you are told, using the balances that you have been given uh, on the income statement and the balance sheet, you need to calculate the ratios that uh, you have been given there. The ratios that you have been given there. So we have them. Number one, we need to compute the acid test ratio. Remember, acid test ratio is uh, one of the current ratios. You take the current assets, you minus inventory from them, and then you divide by current liabilities. Current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities gives you the acid test ratio. Number three is about the inventory turnover. Inventory turnover, you simply take the inventory, sorry, not the inventory, but the cost of sales divided by the average inventory. And then that is it, the cost of sales divided by the average inventory, where average inventory is the opening plus the closing inventories, then you divide it by two. Let us do them practically here. Roman 1 talks about the asset test. This one is given by the current assets. Sorry. Divided by current liabilities. So for this question, are we given the current assets? You need to know if you are not given as a single figure, you need to know which items comprises the current asset or the current asset comprises of what item. In a business, the current assets do normally involve the inventory, the cash in hand, cash at the bank, the debtors, also known as the accounts receivables, then any prepaid expense, any accrued income. Those are the current assets. Inventory. Cash in hand, cash at the bank, debtors or accounts receivables. Then you include prepaid expenses and accrued income. So you can be able to find out what we are given. In this case, we are given inventory, the debtors of the accounts receivable, and the cash at the bank. Those are the current assets. So you need to add those figures. The figure for the inventory is 100,000. You add 46 and 40, that is 86. You get 186 dollars. Those are current assets. You minus the figure for the inventory, then you divide by the figure for current liabilities. In this case, the figure for the current liabilities is given as one figure, 98 dollars. That's right. So that is the same as 86. Thousand divided by my feet. If that is this, zero point eight eight. You normally put it in the ratio form is one. The answer you get, you put it into one. 
this is a ratio, okay? If it, it ratios the answer, then you add this one. That is the activity ratio. Number two is the inventory turnover. Inventory turnover ratio, which is given by the cost of sales divided by average inventory. Cost of sales divided by average inventory. In this question, if you look at the income statement up there, you are given the cost of sales, which is uh, 256. Then you divide by average inventory is opening plus closing divided by 2. But when it is not given as opening plus closing, when you are not given the opening and closing inventory, you are only given one inventory, there is no need of average. Average inventory is opening plus closing divided by 2. But when you are given one inventory figure, like in this case, we are only given inventory 100,000. We are not given the opening and the closing. When it is only one figure for inventory that is given, then there is no need of average. You take that 100,000 as the average cost. You only average when you are given the opening and the closing. But when it is only one, you don't average a single, a single figure. So this one will be for two. This one is 2.58. The number ratio is normally give the answer in terms of times. 2.58 times. This is the rate at which we are replenishing or replacing our inventory in our business. The number of times we are replacing our inventory. So we buy, we sell, and then we replace again, then we sell. The number of times you are replacing your inventory. That is what we call the turnover or inventory turnover ratio. The higher the turnover, then it simply means that the higher are your sales. When the turnover or inventory turnover ratio is high, then it simply means that you are converting your inventory into sales with uh, uh, more number of times. Huh? So your sales is very high. Your sales is very high. The business is performing well. Then we have the average correction period. This is the same as the debtors correction period, which is normally given by Another question is when we have to add the debtors. Correction. It is given by the average debtor or the debtors. Average debtors divided by the credit sales. By 100. Well, not by 100, sorry, by the number of days. The number of days the business operates in a year. So, when you are given a single figure, for example, operating debtors, if you are given the opening debtors balance and the closing debtors balance, you add the two and divide by two to get average. But when it is a single figure, you don't average one figure. You don't average, like in this case, we are only given the debtors as one figure for 6,000, so we cannot average. So here we can take the 46,000, we divide by the sales. When they have not specified the what percentage of the sales was on credit, you just simply take the sales, which is 497,000, and then if they have not given the number of days in the question, you multiply by 3 to 5. This is the number of days in a year. They have not given the, the specific number of days. Other questions we might specify. We can tell you that the company operates in 360 days in a year. Others will be telling you 300 days in a year. When you specify, we use the figure that we have specified. If they don't specify, we take the full number of years in a year, number of days in a year, which is 365. So this one will give you what, 46 dollars divided by 4, 97 dollars. Then you multiply by 3 to 5. You get it is 33 
are taking around the back 3.78 or around the back four days to collect money from the debtors. Remember, debtors are our credit customers. We sold the goods on credit to them. So it takes an average of these days for them to pay us. After we have sold the goods on credit to them, it takes an average of this number of days uh, for them to pay uh, business. So the SAPA, the SAPA, the average correction period or the debtors correction period, the better for the business. If you can be able to correct your debtors or your debts within the shortest time possible, then as a business, you will be performing very well. Hey, you are asking your friend how you got current assets as a one of the dollars. So, as I said, you need to understand what comprises current assets. Current assets are what? What are the current assets? What comprises the current assets? And I've told you, for the current assets, we have the inventory, the debt has, the cash in hand, cash at the bank, prepaid expenses, and accrued income. So you go to the question and you find what are you given. Eh? So based from the question, you are given inventory, the cash at the bank, and the debt has. If you add those figures, they give you one for six hours. You need to know the value of your fingers. What are current assets? What are current uh, fixed assets? The, yes. The, the, the inventory is not specified as closing or opening. Uh -huh. So it doesn't, you don't take that into consideration that they haven't specified that it's closing. So that I can respond properly. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, what is your worry about it? Is it uh, not um, uh -huh. Maybe maybe it could be either. Obviously, if it is in the statement, it is the closing. Yeah? Okay. Yes, because in the balance, we normally use the closing balances, the closing figures. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Sawa. Okay. Uh -huh. Then that is it. Anyway, that is it. The inventory. When you are preparing the balances, you normally prepare balances. Remember, it's prepared at the end of the year. So if it's at the end of the year, the balances that are given there are the balances at the end of the year. So if it is inventory, it is the inventory at the end, which is closing inventory. Good. I hope I have answered the questions that you have. So inventory, and when it is only one, you don't have it. You just take it the way it is. But when it is opening is given, closing is given, you must add the two to get the you add the two and divide it by two. So that you get average debt. The same case with average debt. If you are given the opening debt as balance, the closing debt as balance, you add the two, you divide it by two to get the average. But when it is a single figure, you just take that single figure the average for the year. We go to Roman 4, where it was supposed to be what? Huh? Roman 4, we are supposed to do the return on capital employed, also known as the ROAS. ROAS, the return on capital employed. So for the return on capital employed, you take the net profit before tax, that is the operating profit. Net profit before tax or operating profit, you divide by capital employed. Return on capital employed. We call it gross. Is given by net profit. Before tax, which is also known as the operating 
That one for average collection period. So when when you calculate when you're asked to explain your answer, you say if there are more days for the data to pay, that's not good. If you are given, eh? uh -huh. if you're going to explain the answer you got that degree for day, you say that on average. The company takes mm -hmm. that degree for this day to correct the the text from the data. That is what you simply say. Okay? Unless, okay. unless they have given, sometimes they can give you the industry performance. The industry, the firms in the same industry, on average, the number of days they are taking. Yeah? So if they mm -hmm. have given you the industry performance, and then you have calculated the, uh, the, the average correction period for that business, then you compare with the industry. Then you can be able to say whether the business is performing better than the counterpart in the same industry or is performing worse. Eh? So it will depend. If you are given the, even if it is any other ratio, you can be given the industry benchmark. And then now you can create the ratio and then you can be able to control to explain the performance of the business. So you base your ratios on the industry. So is your business performing better or is it worse compared to the industry performance? So that is how you do it. But when it is like that, a figure you have calculated, you don't have a benchmark to compare, you simply interpret that answer by giving what that simply means. Eh? That's all. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's to equity ratio. That's to equity ratio. This one was number four, number five. That's the equity ratio. And that's the equity ratio. It is one of the gearing ratios, which is given by total liability. Divided by shareholder equity. Total liabilities, both current and uh, long term liabilities, you give or when you add them together, the short term liabilities, short term debts plus the long term debts, if you add them together, they give you the total liability divided by the shareholders' equity. The shareholders' equity is what belongs to the owners of the business, the shareholders' fund, the shareholders' fund. So in this case, we have got uh, the liabilities. The current liabilities are 98,000. The long term loan is 33,000. Both of them are liabilities. You add them together. That is 98 plus 33. You get 1 but 1,000. Total liabilities are 1 but 1,000. That is the current liabilities plus the bank loan. Then you divide by the shareholder's fund or the shareholder's equity, 197,000. So that is one and one divided by one and seven. You get zero point six six or zero point six seven. The proportion of liabilities and the equity. Yeah? So the business is not performing badly because the shareholder equity is one and seven thousand is greater than. One but one thousand. The performance is not that bad. So what I will ask you to do, just go through all the formulas that you have on the ratios. You never know which ratio will be asked, but the most common one that are normally tested in terms of liquidity, they test the current ratio and the acid test ratio. The acid test ratio. Acid test ratio is the same as quick ratio. Quick ratio. Current ratio, current asset divided by current liability. Asset test ratio is current asset minus inventory over current liability. Those two 
are commonly tested on profitability ratios, we ask the net profit margin, the gross profit margin, the return on capital employed. Very common as you go through the others, so you emphasize on that. Then on the turnover ratios, we write testing the interested turnover. We also write the, the debtor correction period, the creditor payment period, and all that. So you need to go through the, the gearing ratio, we write testing the asset, the, 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 the debt equity ratio, and also the gearing ratio. So just go through the, form, uh, the formula. Try as much as possible to understand those formulas. The good thing with the ratios, they will give you the figures. Your work is very simple. Remember the formula and take the figures from what you are given. The figures will be provided for you. Yours is just to remember the formula. Then you read through the figures, you press them in the formula, you get the answer. That's that. That's that. Well, more question. Yes. What is fixed charge capital? Fixed charge capital? Yeah. Are those uh, debts or loans that you take that come with a fixed interest rate? Yeah. Those are the borrowings that you can make, but they have a constant interest. Huh? A good example is the loan. The loan will carry a certain interest. The debenture will come up with a, a, a fixed interest. That is why we have the 10% debenture, 12% debenture, 9% debenture. Those that come with a, a fixed interest rate, they are known as the fixed charge capital. The fixed charge capital. So that one that can also be used to calculate the, the debt uh, equity ratio. The debt to debt? In some cases, you can also be asked to, to calculate debt equity ratio when we have the fixed charge capital. Yes, when you are doing the data, you can also be told to do it. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So let's see. The question number three. Question number three, A, was having an error. That question was not possible to be done. I remember it when we were doing the matching. If you look at the question, yes, we are supposed to use the last in first out, huh? which is repo. But if you look at uh, this question, they have given the purchases how they were made, the purchases for, for February, May, and all that. But when it came to the issues, they only gave us 47,000 units during the year without breaking down. Huh? Without breaking down, they were issued at what date or in which month. So we cannot be able to assume that. So the question was not complete. You cannot be able to do this question as it is. You are going to purchase this. This one you are going to receive. And then you are told that the shop sold 47,000 units during the year. Yes, they were sold during the year, but specifically when? Because you need to know if they were issued in February so that you can be able to issue them in February. Yeah? If they were issued in May, we do the same. Right? But this one, they never specified where exactly the issues were made. So we cannot be able to get all the receipts then we minus all the, all the issues. That is not the, the intention of this question. This question should give us when they are bought and when they are sold, so that when they are sold, we can be able to apply last in first out. This question it is not possible to do that. And the, question, the candidate who attempted the question, they were able to get their marks, but we cannot attempt it. Malimo, what happens in that case if a, if a, a, a candidate uh, uh, attempts the question? What one. happens? Because one. it is not their mistake. They don't know whether it was not done right or wrong, but they have attempted to do the question the way it is. 
So um, is it marked or they are deducted? That's why I'm saying if you attempted it, mm. it's part of your choice. Remember section B you choose, eh? you choose in a three. So if it was a question of your choice, you get your marks. You get your marks. Huh? That's all. Okay. You get your marks. Uh, that is it. If you attempt it. But if you do not attempt, you, you, you make a different choice, then uh, you don't get any marks to that. So you get three marks. Sorry? You get marks. three marks even if you are wrong. <laughs> Obviously, yes. You get your marks because it is not your mistake. How can they expect you to get to the right answer in the wrong question? You get okay. your marks. So question 3B, it's about it and very who intend to start a business, but they are constrained by capital. Explain the various sources of capital they may consider. So this is a question that is coming from the topic business finance or the sources of business finance. Where can they get their finances from? So you will just explain to them. We have got many sources of finance. One, they can borrow from. Two, they can ask for the friends and relatives to assist them. Three, they can do what we call the trade credit. Trade credit is where they buy goods on credit and then they repay for the goods later after they have sold them. They can go for the trade credit whereby they can be financed by the supplier. The supplier can give the goods on credit to them. They sell, they retain the profit, they pay for the goods. We also have the higher purchase. They can be able to finance some of the assets, the fixed assets that is through the higher purchase. They buy them, then they pay in installments. Then they pay in installments. So those are some of the sources you need to explain any five of them. And then you get your 10 marks. The 10 marks. The loan, the credit credit, the higher purchase. They can borrow from friends. Uh, if it, uh, because these are just individuals. If it was a company, we should have talked about it. They should have issued the shares. They should have issued the debentures. But these are individuals, two of them. Probably they are doing a partnership. So you can uh, be able to advise them based on the nature of the business. You cannot talk about shares here. So what do you see? more business. You can also get some grants. That is uh, from things like the land cost making organization that can support them. We also have the listing. Listing whereby they can get if they want to run the business and they can asset but they cannot be able to purchase by cash they can go for higher purchase or even the issue eh? they get the asset they use them in the business as they pay periodic rentals we call them the rentals towards the their staff and all that then question number four it is talking about what okay. The following balances were extracted from the books of Maito Cedas for the year that ended that year, that first December 2021. So we are given the balances there, and then we are told we prepare a statement of comprehensive income. Statement of comprehensive income, it is the same as the income statement income statement. If we are going to do it now, I've always insisted that this is a question that uh, will never meet. The financial statements they will never meet in the exam. They must ask that. And 
or in good marks here, and it's simply remembering the flow. How do you arrange your items in this statement? So this is my text setup. I For the year end, we are told it that first December Always remember for the income statement or statement of comprehensive income, we always start in the sales. We always start with the sales. But we need to find out do we need three columns or two columns for the currency? For you to be able to know whether you need two or three columns, look at whether purchases might require some adjustment. Look at whether we have purchases returns or return outward or current in one. If we have those two or any one of them, we can require three columns. But if they are not there, two are enough. From my case here, if I run through this, I can't see them. I can't see current in one. I can't see purchases returns. Therefore, two columns can serve us perfectly. So sales goes to the last column up there. Remember there, if you look at what we are provided there, sometimes these people can uh, try to trick you. Yeah? So they have told you it is purchases and sales. One figure is on the debit column. Remember the first column is always the debit. The other figure is on the credit. But they have told you it's purchases and sales. So they want to test you whether you know which figure goes to the debit and which one goes to the creditor. Always know that sales is credited, so the balance here on the credit is for the sales. Purchases is normally debited, so the balance here on the debit column is for the purchases. So you need to know that they might or they, they are trying to test you whether you know those basics. The other one here is the account receivable and the account payable. Accounts receivable here, as you know, it is the other name for debtors. Debtors are normally debited, they are assets. Account payable, it is the other name for creditors. Creditors are liabilities, the liabilities normally have the credit card. So, so 12,000 is for the account payable, that 4,000 is for the account receivable. So you note that they might actually confuse you with those simple tactics. Sometimes even the discounts, they can just write here discounts and then they, figure, they put a figure on the debit and another one on the credit. You need to know discount allowed is an expense, expenses are debited, they have a debit balance. Discount received is an income, incomes they normally have credit balance. Also the returns, they can just write their returns. Then they put one figure on the debit and another one on the credit. Return inwards is the one that normally have the debit. Return outward, which is on the credit. So don't fail this question by those tricks. Don't fail the question because of those simple tricks. You should be able to overcome them. So here, the figure for the sales we have agreed with the figure on the credit goes for the two dollar. To that. We need to find out once you have captured the figure for the sales, the only item that can affect the sales is the sales returns. Return in once. If it is there, you rest from sales. If it is not there, then that is the final sales. The sales returns. So in the question, I can't see it, it is not there. So from sales, we normally rest out of sales. The cost of what we sold. Here we have opening inventory. Opening inventory, inventory first January for our 
are the purchases. The purchases we have agreed is the figure on the debit column. If you add the two, it will give you 154 power. The cost of goods are available. Huh? For sale, this figure 154 power is what is available for sale. The opening plus the additional stock, the additional stock is the purchases. You have the total. Of goods available to be sold to that year. Then you minus less closing inventory. The closing inventory, which in most cases is normally captured with the additional information tax. Closing inventory, in most cases, it is on the additional information tax. And it is there as Roman one under the additional information. Inventory at the end of the year was 30,000. Correct? 30,000 from 154,000, you will get your cost of sale. You take this product column, 154,000. So, in simple terms, cost of sale is the opening plus purchases minus the closing. Opening inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory gives you. The cost of sale. Now it is a simple comparison. This is the cost, this is the sales income. You sold or you generated this income from the goods that had costed us 124,000. If the sales income is more than the cost, then the business will generate or earn a gross profit. Earn a gross profit. This Get one for the six hours at your gross profit. Then, to the gross profit, find out that the business has any other source of income. That the business has any other source of income. The other incomes may include discount received, which is there, you have here. Rent income or rent received, you add here. Commission received, you add here. Interest received, you add here. And decrease in doubt to debt. Decrease in doubt to debt. If you are there, you put it up here. I can see allowance for doubt to debt. If you look at the trial balance, allowance for doubt to debt is a thousand. And then you compare with the additional information. Additional information from month six. Allowance for accounts receivable. Account receivable, remember the debtors. So, allowance for account receivable is allowance for that, the debtors. It is to be adjusted to 2%. So, what you need to do, you will calculate 2% of account receivable, 2 over 100, times the account receivable, which is a figure of what? Account receivable is at four thousand. You find that it is uh, six hundred and eighty. I hope you can be able to see that. From and six of the additional information, allowance for account receivable that is allowance for out of the is to be adjusted to two percent. So you take two percent of the account receivable or the debtors, you get it to six hundred. If you compare at the start of the year, allowance for doubt to debt as per the trial balance, it is a thousand. But at the end, we have been told to adjust it to 680. So it has decreased from a thousand to 680. It's a decrease. That decrease is considered as an income and should be added to the gross profit. Decrease in doubt to debt, right there, add, decrease. It has decreased from a thousand to six eighty. Understand where we got six eighty from two percent of the account receivable. Two percent of the account receivable 
So that, that is why we put to go through the external bank and partner. 5,000 sales were not for this year. So we cannot include it as a sales income for this year. For the year ended at 1st December 2021, these 5,000 are not part of the sales for this year. So it is for the year 2023. So we minus that. Good. Then, we go to the expenses. One, we have, when you are talking about expenses, most of them might require adjustment. So you start with the additional information expenses, those that are affected. One of them is rent, that is additional information. Two, rent owing. And we we'll say when it is owing, outstanding, accrued, under any other form of outstanding, we add the owing of what? 500. So the rent here, the rent and rates is given like that. The 
figure for the rest and rates from the sum balance is from 500. That is what was paid. Mwali, maybe you could check on the gross profit figure. I'm not sure that's the correct uh, answer when we subtract. Sorry? The Who gross profit it? figure is not 152. Minus 124. Wow. Oh. I don't know how I that. Yeah. Because that one has to be spread. Okay, thank you. We are talking about this rent oil. When it is oil, Sometimes we will call it outstanding accrued bill. We add, we add what we paid is for 500 plus the bill of 500. So we were supposed to pay rent and rates around this world of 5,000. That is done. On my grid, part of the wages and salaries was 1,800 wages for offloading goods. The way so that means that eighteen hundred of the wages was not actually the wages expense. The salaries are needed. We take the figure that we have there for the four thousand minus eighteen hundred. Minus fifteen hundred. So, what were the salaries and wages for running the business? We get fifty-two two hundred. Eighteen hundred. We were part for. We were not part of the salaries and wages for running the business. Number four, it is the provision for the depreciation. Depreciation on buildings. You are told it is 5% on cost. You take 5 over 100 times the cost of the building. The building has cost. You take the cost, not the, the figure that we have given you there. That is our cost. Building is the bracket at cost, which is 100,000, not, 100, not 10,000, 100,000. That is the presentation of building. The other one is the presentation of furniture. Furniture are depreciated at the rate of 20 of 100, 20% of the cost of the furniture. The furniture at cost. The last one is now for the furniture. For the furniture, as of yesterday, it is 25,000. For the furniture, it is going to be what? 20 percent. If you read the question clearly, if you say furniture, it is 20 percent on the using balance. 20% on reducing balance. When it is reducing balance, I told you you multiply by the next supply. So you take the cost of the furniture 10,000, do minus accumulated depreciation. You minus accumulated depreciation. How do you know the accumulated depreciation of furniture? Can you go to the figure where we have furniture? In bracket, it is the cost of 10,000. Furniture's cost is 10,000. But the current value as given in the sale balance is 6800. So they costed us 10,000. But right now they have a value of 6800, meaning that they have already lost that 200. I don't know whether it is making sense. You are given furniture in the bracket cost is 10,000, but the figure that they have captured there is 6800. Then the question is. If the cost was 10,000, but now, right now, they have a value of 600. So they had already lost uh, the 
kedore dulu nanti di mana mana ini tidak salah simpul itu dia udah tahu semuanya nanti di mana itu tidak tahu semuanya nanti di mana itu simpul artis juga mau kenal twenty percent of eight hundred ya eight hundred is the current value you don't multiply by the cost ten thousand you multiply by the net net book value the net book value is two hundred six eight hundred and fifty four It is a matter of understanding the flow. Even that, even if you have made one or two errors, but the flow is fixed, you will still get the fix for the correct entries that you have made. Understand? So don't mix the assets here. Don't mix. Let us not have expenses coming before arriving at the close profit or the profit. Just know what is supposed to be captured at what stage. Mwalimu, you are supposed to show the the workings, or you can work it elsewhere, and you just put the hmm? the, the the workings. Are you are we required to put the workings? They want to see the workings, like mm -hmm. on these depreciations, yeah. Or mm -hmm. you can work it elsewhere and that, just include them, yeah. It is good to include them so that it can clearly be seen where you have arrived at the where you have okay. arrived at the there is a chart here. The projection on furniture. So the projection, just a minute, yes, let me see. Somebody is uh, saying that this answer is different. Confirm. Huh? Confirm whether the answer here is different for the city. If it is not that you can use the correct one. So for the projection, you need to be very careful. 
two methods are going to be asked, whether it is a cost, sometimes they call it on situation, you simply multiply by the cost of that asset. So here, this two, the appreciation is on cost. That's why we can multiply by the cost. But for the furniture, the appreciation is on reducing balance. If it is on reducing balance, you don't multiply by the cost. You multiply by the, the current value. You multiply by the current value. You multiply by the current value. The current value is 800. They were bought at 10,000, but currently, by the start of the year, their value has reduced to 600. So that 600 is what you multiply by the rate of depreciation. But when it is on cost, you multiply by the purchasing cost. That is the difference. That's why they are used to 600. And this 600 is simply what? 10,000 minus that 200 that is the loss. So it's not that. Good. Explain five types of errors which are not disclosed by actual balance. Those errors, they are normally seven. One is the error of omission. The errors which are not disclosed or the errors which do not affect the trial balance. Those errors which do not affect the trial balance, they are normally seven or six. Have the error of omission. Have the error of omission. The error of principle. The error of complete reversal. Of entries. You also have the error of original entry. Compensating errors. And uh, transformation. Those are the errors which are not disclosed in the trial balance. We also call them the errors which do not affect the trial balance. So you can be able to explain what we are, error of omission. When the transaction is completely omitted. When the transaction is completely omitted, we call it the error of omission. The error of commission, when the transaction is entered in the wrong personal account, when the transaction is entered in the wrong personal account, we call it the error of what? Commission. You enter the transaction in the wrong person's account or personal account. Error of principle, when the transaction is entered in the wrong class of account, Entered in the wrong class of accounts. Complete reversal of entries when the accounts to be debited is credited and the one to be credited is debited, you do the reverse. The accounts to be debited, you credit, and the one that you are supposed to credit, you debit. The other one is original entry when you use the same wrong amount. If your cards were to use the same wrong amount, 
to debit and credit the affected accounts. The same wrong amount to debit and credit the affected accounts. You use the same wrong amount to debit and credit the affected accounts. Compensating errors, those are errors that cancel the effect of each other. Errors that cancel the effect of each other. They cancel the effect of each other. And transposition errors and the errors were this actually the same as the original entry. The errors were by a wrong sequence of figures in an amount, a wrong sequence of digits, a wrong sequence of digits in an amount is used in debiting and crediting the affected account. A long sequence of digits in an amount is used to debit and credit the affected accounts. Those are the errors that are not disclosed in the trial balance. When you commit them, your trial balance will still balance. Your trial balance will still balance. The reuses of the concept of time value of money into a business. How do we apply the concept of time value of money? One is capital budgeting. Capital budgeting, that is in project evaluation. We have been doing that for those in the new curriculum. We take the counting part of it. When we want to do the next present value, the profitability index, we are applying the time value of money. So in capital budgeting or project evaluation, that is one of them. Number two, they are used in making financing decisions. They are used in making financing decisions. So if you want to borrow the loan and all that, you must do some uh, form of what? You must do some present value of that loan to compare with the benefits that is uh, you discount. You discount that loan, and then you can be able to know whether the cost of borrowing the loan and uh, the returns from where you are going to invest the loan, which one is higher and whether it is worth borrowing that loan. You can compare, I want to borrow a loan and I want to invest in a project that will give me a return of 15%. If that 15% is the expected return and you are borrowing the loan and the interest rate is 15%, so obviously it is not worth. But if the return is 15% and the interest being charged by the bank is 15%, then that loan can be can be sought because the benefits that you are going to get from the investing the loan will be higher in making financing decisions, choosing the source of finance so that you can finance a particular project. Number three is about the dividend policy. Dividend policy. So you determine how much are you supposed to pay for the dividends. It can also be applied there. The other one is uh, in merger and acquisition decision, mergers and acquisition decisions. So you can be able to determine the purchase price of a particular business entity. You want to acquire a business entity, you can apply the concept of time value of money to value the future cash flows from that particular business that you want to acquire so that you can find it whether it is worth it being invested or investing in that business. Whether it is worth investing in that business. You can get more. We have a, some notes somewhere on the time value of money and its application. The payback period is here. You are told that to create the payback period. So for the those in the old curriculum, don't, don't worry about what we are doing here. This one is not part of it. This is the financial management. So this one you can just even for one minute we we'll finish it. And then we we'll proceed with what is relevant to you as the old curriculum. So for the payback period. Back 
Then here we have given the cash flow, 50,000, 14,000, 10,000, 36,000, and 16,000. Then here we normally do accumulated cash flow. Back in the first one, which is 60,000, plus 14, it becomes 64,000, plus 10, it becomes 74,000, plus 26, it is 100,000, plus 16, it was 16,000. Those are the related factors. So, how much was the cost? We are investing how much? The cost of investment. So how many years you need to take? Remember, we are investing 100,000 in a project that is going to generate these tax flows. So how many years you need to take for us to recover our 100,000? You can be able to see that 100,000 is there. So our payback period is what? Our payback period is four. Our payback period, payback period is four years. Our payback period is four years. A hundred thousand will have been recovered after four years. So year one we recover fifty thousand. So year one and year two we have recovered back sixty four thousand. Year one, two, and three we have recovered seventy four thousand. Year one, two, three, and four we have recovered our full amount that we invested in that project for years. Done. Question number question number five B, it is about the petty cash book. In this petty cash book, the funny thing that they never give us the analysis columns. They never give us the analysis columns. So we need to do some uh, grouping. We can do our own analysis column. So Tendawema keeps her petty cash book on interest system. The interest amount is 25,000 for the month of April 2021. Her petty cash transaction is as follows. The petty cash balance was uh, 1130. The petty cash presented vouchers and obtained uh, cash of 23,000. Uh -huh. And then using that, the following payments now are made on all boat postage or boat postage. I don't know how to, I think it is postage sum. Pay the creditor, pay the bus fare, boat envelopes, receive the cash for personal telephone call, and then we have boat fuel. So let us do our own analysis column. But the format remains the first four columns. We say we need a column always for the receipt. We need a column for the date, the details, the expense amount. And then we now insert an analysis column, which we can now generate ours. The analysis columns from what we can see here is the four page. Yeah, so the hey, creditor, when you say somebody, we call it Raja. When you say a person from the petty cash, it's Raja. Hey, the bus there, yeah, we can call it transport. Boats. Envelopes, we can call that stationary. Uh, stationary. This is the cash for personal telephone call. When anything is personal, those are simply blows. And then both to a square and four hundred transports.
That has happened like that. So on first of April, first of April, there is a balance that is balance broke down. It is eleven thirty. Remember, we say under the basis that is where we record the flows. Eh? The amount meant for paying the petty expenses must be half. And then on second. We obtained cash of twenty three thousand. The only problem I have with them is that they are telling us that the interest is twenty five thousand. But when we add a balance and this tax that was reversed, it does not stop off twenty five thousand. But we use it as a given. We use it as a given. But it's supposed to stop off. They are operating under the interest system. The balance plus the reimbursement is the total of the book. Mm -hmm. Those are the errors that I normally tell you with the QRT paper. If they were wise, they could have told us on second the petty cash presented vouchers and was reimbursed. And was reimbursed the yeah, amount spent. So that we have that second the balance is subtract from 25,000 to get the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. But they were not. Able to do so, they have given us the amount that was obtained in cash as well with the reimbursement for the code. So let us work with that as it is. Then on fourth, now the payments happen. We need to proceed the report process, the report identity process comes to be printed that belongs to the post On nine. What we do by or we pay that creditor. When you pay a person, this is uh, that one belongs to the ledger. When you do this is the ledger, when you pay a person from the creditor. On the other of equity, we paid for the bus fare. The bus fare was for the insurance that is meant for transport. On 17th of the report and the ops. This number of are amounting to 700. Those are specialized. On 6th, this is the personal. The personal credit here. And then 26 of April, we put square. The square here is a thousand. The square is a, a transport cost. Then from there, we know what we do. We add the figures. This one will give us is 800. This is 700. This is 2720. Then three is so can you add them? They give you the top of them. It's paper plus seven hundred plus twenty-seven twenty plus twenty-three fifty plus fifty. You get three hundred. You ask yourself. What was the total amount that the petty cashier had? He had a balance plus this plus the cash reimbursement plus 23, 24 and 30. Out of 24 and 30, we will spend this. So, how much is the balance? We get 17. Pardon? Yes? Uh, 
please pardon the back forward. In the, in the photo of this, we have photo pass that the package has here with you. You have spent this. Obviously, the fact that you have minus what you have spent, you get the balance. So, the what you spent plus the balance is this equal to what you are given. This photo should be the same. The balance is simply the total receipt minus the total payment, the total expense amount paid. You get that balance. You add what you paid plus the balance should be equal to what you had returned. Any question? You have a question. I want to stop there. We cannot be able to tackle question six at the time we are drawn. But uh, question six A is what we did on Monday. Just look at what we did on Monday, the cost of capital. The factors that influence the cost of capital is there. So this allows you to go down in the double line for a time. And we don't like that. So we can maybe see that question that I don't know whether time will be allowed to do so. But for today we cannot go beyond that. So you know, for those who are having this revision class, we cannot have another revision. We cannot have another revision on the It is technically impossible because your exam, I wish I hope they are on Wednesday next week, the paper. Is it on uh, on twelve? Wednesday, yeah. Yes, Wednesday yeah. next week. You cannot have a class on Wednesday on your video exam. It is technically impossible. That is the time you will be making your way to the exam. So I will see whether we can have a bigger session somewhere. But so far, so I know we have done more than that. And I know to ask, but uh, if I get time and time, we can have the last session. Maybe if you have any issue, you can bring it forward on that day. And evening, we can have our last session there. But for today, 